This episode's part of a special feature series on New York City and is a co-presentation with the Museum of the City of New York with generous support from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Find us at yourhometown.org or on your favorite podcast app. We're in the theater. I'm like seven, eight, nine. All the other kids in the theaters, are, it's all kids. But most of them are older than me, and they're, and they're rougher. And here comes my grandmother. She's the oldest person by 40 years in that theater. And she gets so carried away when the monster finally gets flamethrowed or <laughs> immolated or... Um, Whatever, <laughs> she would stand up and st- she was so carried away. She, she, I remember her standing up once and saying, Good for you, you bastard. How do you, how do you, how does that feel? Where did you grow up is a question we're all asked a lot, but the answer is never as simple as a place on a map, is it? It's about the kid inside of us and what happened to them there before we met the world and the world met us. I'm Kevin Burke, and this is your hometown. My guest is the novelist and screenwriter Richard Price. Writers I know talk about him the way actors do Brando and Denzel. Many consider him one of the greatest writers of dialogue of all time. His ear to the pavement, painting the way real people really talk. You know it's a Richard Price story by the way the characters he writes bang hard up against the walls of life. I'm talking cops, gang members, drug dealers, bartenders, taxi drivers, and the like. There are no one-dimensional saints or sinners to the windows he opens for us. His books include The Wanderers, Clockers, and Freedom Land. And for television, he's collaborated on such landmark HBO series as The Wire, The Deuce, The Night Of, which was incredible, and his recent adaptation of the Stephen King novel, The Outsider, which is scary. Now, you'd think from this list that Richard Price would be the ultimate tough guy, a writer who runs with the cops, but you'd be wrong at least in the superficial definition of the word tough. No, Richard Price's strengths, I found out, come from a different place, a different time, and different people. When we sat down to talk at his home in central Harlem, I was curious to know the extent to which the fictional worlds he's created are stand-ins for the place where he actually grew up in the 1950s and 60s. I'm talking in the Parkside Houses of the East Bronx section of New York, a city, he told me, that's really better understood as a series of hometowns than one giant metropolis. As he laid it out, sitting across from me in his front parlor. When people say New York, I'm a New Yorker, they talk about Manhattan. People live in Queens, they, the outer boroughs, those are different worlds. You know, they're like, they're like satellites. Mm-hmm. We, the area is the world. You live in, I live in the nation of central Harlem. Um, I used to live in the nation of hipster Soho and Oho. Um, I used to live in the nation of Gramercy Park. I used mm-hmm. to live in the nation of Parkside Park. You know, there's, there's all these microclimates, and there's no passports. You just know when you're not there Yeah, that you're, that you're not there anymore. So the Parkside was built in 1950. We were the, my, I was an infant. My parents were one of the original tenants. Uh, it was a two-bedroom apartment. My bedroom I shared with my brother whatever books I had on some you know skimpy bookcase I guess there was a desk um until I hit puberty I was uh, really into wrestling this is in the so early 60s is, and uh there was a magazine called Wrestling Review and they always had a centerfold of you know some uh color centerfold of the wrestler of the month and I would tape them to the walls um, I remember that it was like a bunch of beefcake on my walls and I had no notion of sexuality or anything and as I look back it was you know I don't know why I did that but that's what I did um, the other thing is my father was a window dresser in the Bronx and he worked in women's and children's clothing uh, small stores uh, mostly in the South Bronx 
you know, as a, you know, doing their windows. So depending on a season, he would have to get props. And at one time he purchased all these Ivy League pennants, like Joe College, like, you know, no, you know, that part of the Bronx, very few people ever went to college. But And when that season was over, he gave me all these pennants, uh, Yale, Columbia, Northwestern, I remember it was purple, and, you know, about a dozen of them, and I pinned them to the walls. And those are the two memories I have. My brother had no choice. He was younger. He had no choice what goes on the walls. You set the tone. <laughs> and when you were growing up in the neighborhood, how would you assess the, the power dynamics of your neighborhood? Who had power? Who didn't have it? Well, first of all, my world was children, not adults. Mm -hmm. So who had power was the tough kids. I mean, basically, it was a working-class neighborhood. It's like uh, best athletes, um, uh, best-looking girls, and the toughest kids. I mean, this is like a child's eye view. Um, like every... There was a big... There was a large central playground called Big Playground. That was, they just called it Big Playground. Divided between handball courts, basketball courts, and an extended uh, area that was more like swings for younger kids. And the, the basketball courts especially, uh, which were sometimes used for touch football games because uh, they were big enough, that was the gladiator's pit. And that's where legends were made, heroes were made, legendary fighters uh, super athletes, um, so that, in terms of adults, the only authorities in my life, formal authorities in my life were my teachers, which I never questioned, and uh, everybody had parents, so the assumption was, well, if, if it's a dad or a mom, you know, they're the boss of your life. And did the world up there feel circumscribed to you, or did it feel expansive when you were growing up? It just felt like the world. And in fact, Parkside, which only had 20 buildings, I spent 18 years there, but uh, people were like yokels who never left their fourth of the projects. I don't remember ever, um, I was at the bottom of the hill, there was a hill which is White Plains Road, the L train went mm -hmm. right past my window. Uh, I don't remember going beyond the playground, which is at the crest of the hill, uh, to the other side, going down towards Bronx Park East. You know, it was like Xenophon. You know, you know your quarter, and if you wound up in, in a di diagonal opposite quarter, it's like, how the hell do I get out of here? And were there places that you were told not to go? To um, not really. Because the, the, note, the thing about Parkside and, and the appeal and the social engineering behind it is you have a bunch of World War II veterans, young, just coming out, marrying their high school sweethearts with no housing stock whatsoever. And so they're forced to live like my parents, with my mother's parents, in my mother's childhood bedroom. I was born in my mother's childhood bedroom. I didn't think about it. You know, I just, this is where I live. And nothing was off limits because it wasn't like, well, I'm going to go down to the bad part of the Bronx. Or I'm going to go, you know, to some swamp in the northern Bronx that turned out to be Freedom Land many years later, then Co-op City. Um, it was a world. You lived in the world. It was like a village or a medieval village, you know, where they say, you know, people never went more than um, 10 miles from the spot they were born all their lives. You know, when I was writing Clockers, I was hanging out at the crime scene unit. Uh, NYPD crime scene unit, which attended all murders. And um, this was in the height of the crack era. And there was a murder in the Bronx. Um, some guy was on, a pay, was on a pay phone outside of Beldega. Some other guy had just gotten off, had a big fight with his girlfriend on the phone, uh, was walking away, his back to the phone, fuming like about his girlfriend, and he just impulsively decided to wheel around and shoot the payphone. Unfortunately, some guy was on it, and he killed him. And so here's the guy laying there, and uh, I asked the detectives, how, the hell, you, how do you know? How are you going to find a guy? It's like, it's like a mystery, a dead guy on a payphone. 
How many guns are there in the Bronx? How many bullets are there in the Bronx? And he said, he said, well, catch them, because these are always born where their ancestors are born, and they always walk in the path of their ancestors. In other words, he's in the neighborhood. He doesn't have the imagination to run away. Ironically, when they took out the, ad, uh, the wallet of the dead guy, and I saw the address, it was f no, 492 Concord Avenue. And somehow, maybe five years later, I realized my grandfather, before I was born, my great-grandfather owned that building, and my mother and all my mother's side of the family were raised in that building. How's that for so what goes around comes around? That's unbelievable. Cerebral palsy affected your right arm and leg when you were a kid. And I'm wondering how that shaped your expectations of what you could do, who you could be, versus the expectations that others had of you and meeting you. Well, that was a big point of anxiety for my parents, not for me. Mm -hmm. um, because I remember they woke me up in the middle of the night, I, or probably not the middle of the night, but I was six. And they were worried it woke me up to say, you have to go to college because with your hand, you can't, you can't even dig a ditch, which is not true, I, but you have to go to college. And I'm six, and so I knew a very conservative That's kindergarten, first people, grade, yeah. And um, uh, they, were, they were in a panic that, uh, what can I do? I can't be a laborer. I can't, you know, I have to go to college. So, the other time they woke me up like that, there was a guy, I think his name was Al Erder, and he had a messed up right hand, much like myself. I don't know, he might, it might not have been CP. And uh, in the 1956 Olympics, he was a 30 pound hammer thrower, you know. And it, they woke me up to show me a Life magazine. Look what he can do. Look what you can do. And they said, oh, great, now i got to be an Olympian <laughs> hammer thrower just because I have a bad hand and a two-handed sport. Are you kidding me? But I, other than that, I was very self-conscious, you know, once you get into teenage, you know, you think of girls and you, I was like, I, you know, my right side had always been skinnier. So of course, I was self-conscious. I would never wear short sleeve shirts. But other than that, I mean... And in your neighborhood, you mentioned that sort of the coin of the realm with the gladiators who were these great sort of athletes on the court. And sort of that's kind of the hierarchy with the tough guys and that's kind of... And the athletes that flowed down from there. And you mentioned... This is a child's side point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Which I can picture myself being right back there in Newburgh yeah. where I grew up. I was going to ask you just where you saw yourself in relationship to that coin of the realm, that, that kind of that, oh, that they, gladiator. No, I, I was... Um, they were generals. I was lucky to be in the army at all, you know. No, these were people, you know, you're kind of in awe of. Um, so it was all about physical prowess. Uh, if you were a big brain, you know, you know, um, and you wound up going to Bronx Science after everything. Which you did, yeah. Which I did. Mm -hmm. That didn't count as much when your glands are going crazy, you sure. know, and you're bugling like an elk, you know. <laughs> um, but I don't remember anybody mocking, mocking me. And this is a playground in a working class neighborhood. These are knock around kids. Nobody ever made fun of me. I mean, I was a good little athlete. I mean, basketball was bad, hard for me because everybody knew which way I was dribbling because I couldn't pass off to the other hand. But handball, which is, to be good at handball, you really have to be ambidextrous. Mm -hmm. I was a one-handed hand, you know, I was a, just a one-handed handball player who made my varsity team in high school. Um, I always, see, this is how Parkside accommodated me uh, around gladiator sports. 
I always played first base in a softball game because everybody knew I can't catch and throw with the other hand. So first, if we had touch football games, I always played quarterback because I couldn't catch with two hands and I could throw and I had a strong arm. So, I mean, it's so funny. In some ways, it was such a mean place, yet it, it was unflappable around what, what they could have picked on me. Mm-hmm. And they just accommodated me. It, it was like, wasn't even spoken. It was never, somebody said, um, ah, Price, you can't play. You know, they said, um, I would say, I want to play first base. And everybody understood why. And nobody said, no, you got to play shortstop. Everybody understood why. I always played first base. I always um, played touch football. Even though uh, the world outside my apartment was a more, was a more brutal world in some ways. It was a more, uh, any, anything can happen at any time. I always felt like just, just like everybody else. Nobody ever made me feel otherwise. My mother had a very hard time with me in general when I was young. She, she had a lot of rage in her. So I was born in 49. The doctor we had was very old. He delivered my mother in 1925. And he was, he was a doc, you know, like all doctors, in the Bronx, you know, he he went he house call, house call, house call, house call. And he was pretty old at this point. You know, he had a lifetime of experience. But I can't imagine he had, he was steely-eyed and steady, steady. Anyways, it was a messed up birth. The oxygen was cut off, they said to me, for 15 seconds, which affected uh, the left side of my brain, which is my whole right side, my leg. I used to walk with a curled-in toe. Um, and uh, if... But they also told me, and I know this for a fact, if that, those 15 seconds were 45 seconds, I would have been so much, so much more severely affected. Um, and um, they had a lot of time, you know, I'd go to hospital, you know, clinics or see, and they, they, the, the therapy at that point was, re, was useless. Chiropractors. To stretching, or you got telling he's got to squeeze the ball, you know, mm-hmm. he's you know because he he's got to stand and stretch his Achilles tendon. So, my mother, she took me to a children's uh, clinic for CP once. I have no memory of it, and she said I felt ashamed there because all these other kids they look like Stephen Hawking's, and there you were running around, and I never went back. I was embarrassed. She'd always say. Did you do your exercises? The way I walked, the heel of my shoe would wear down at a diagonal. And I know that, uh uh-oh, if if my mother sees my shoe at that angle, she knows I haven't been doing what, what the chiropractor said to do. And I never did. It was so boring. I was young. Who the hell wants to squeeze a ball like an idiot, you know? Um, and so I used to look at my heel, the heel of my shoe all the time. So, you know, in anxiety, and that would send her off on a hair pulling tirade against me. And what was her, what was the source of the rage? She wanted you to, to, to be better? I think the she source of her rage happened? was she... her rage. Um, it was endemic on I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not her psychiatrist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have my own thoughts, but I'll keep them to sure, myself. Sure. But I know in my house, I knew that cerebral palsy, it was a trigger for my mother's uh, much more amorphous mega rage. Um, my brother wasn't subjected to this at all, and but she basically kept, kept me in a state of semi-watery terror. It was clear that being inside as a kid, living in Parkside wasn't, well, a walk in the park for Richard Price. But when I asked him about his extended family living in other parts of the Bronx, his whole face changed. Another major planet on his map of New York was his maternal grandparents' apartment at 1522 Vice Avenue, where his grandmother Pauline, his bubby as he called her, acted as a very different force and influence on his young life. 
the only thing I remember either of my grandparents ever saying to me about my hand, um, my grandfather never said anything. Um, my grandmother, my doting grandmother, the one that I love more than anybody. Pauline? She's Yeah. Pauline. She, um, she, I was her firstborn, and she treated me like another girlfriend. And she was a very uh, isolated woman. She was very heavy. Um, she, she was like straight up love, but it wasn't, it was more than love. It was like, she was confiding in me. She said, to, I remember when I was little, but and we used to have animated, I was like very precocious, conversationless, curious, you know, I was very uninhibited sharing my thoughts. And so we were buddies. She was very lonely. And I remember she, she looked at me once and she said to me, all right, you're a little crippled, but boy, you got a brain on you, <laughs> you know. And it, but that's you know, she said it very un, un, you know, she didn't think about how do I, how do, how do you say to a kid with cerebral palsy? Blah, blah, blah. She just said it, and I just went check, got it, thank you. Okay, moving on, moving on, yeah. exactly. Secret eater. Um, mm. She was very high strung. She was short and obese. Um, my grandfather was was a little, a little bit of a uh, ladies' man. Um, she, according to my mother, she was crazy about him, but she thinks he only married her because her parents didn't think he was good enough for her. So that kind of that was a Rosen, Artie Rosenbaum. Artie he was Rosenbaum, born in Russia. Truck driver. He came here yeah. as a as a one or a two year old. Grew up on the Lower East Side. Was a you know was a little toughy. Um, he was he wanted to be a member of this older Jewish gang because the Jewish gangs were just as bad as any other gangs back mm -hmm. there. Um, and he got in trouble. He, he was arrested because he had a gun in his in a shoebox in his mother's um, closet because the older guys, and again, they always used to hang around in pool halls. And, and he was like this, he was a little guy, he was like Leo Gorsi and the Bowery Boys. And they say, hey, Artie, you want to be a member of the gang? Uh, don't open his shoebox, take it home. It was, it was used in a, in a shooting. And, um, but he was so always- for that. He was a fighter, he, he was a fist fighter. She came from a, a little bit of a more classier Jewish family. Her father was a furrier. Um, that was a big deal back then, yeah. And, you know, he didn't have a father. His, you know, his mother took in boarders, you know, in, in whatever tenement they were jumping around to. Um, this, this is all the Lower East Side at that time? All the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. um, she was playing the piano at some party, and he was there. Oh, I'll show that. Who the hell do they think they are? Come here, we're getting married. But she was kind of, he was very... He was a very attractive man in his own street way, you know. I wouldn't say there were a lot of professors that would have gone for him, but, you know, I mean, um, you know, in his world, he was a good-looking guy. He had a way about him, um, and he was, he, a lot of women were drawn to him, according to my mother. He was, he, he wasn't home a lot, let's put it that way. And so your grandmother's loneliness partly stemmed from that? She was very, yeah, she was, well... He, he had no interest. You know, as they got older, they were inseparable. But, what, you know, when he was still uh, in, in uh, bugling season, you know, between his job, which took him out of the house at four in the morning, and whatever he did after that, um, I remember uh, most of the time when I'd go, when I was little, 
when I'd spend, I was allowed to spend like a Saturday night with my grandmother on Vice Avenue, which to me was heaven. But when people say the Bronx is, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning, they're talking about Vice Avenue. Wow. And um, it's so funny. In some ways, it was such a mean place. Yet, I think a neighborhood is judged by a child, not or an adult even, not by um, its statistics. This is where the love was. And that could be a mud hut or it could be a palace. It doesn't make a difference. Where, where's the love? Where did I feel safest? Where did I feel like I didn't have to think about me in the world? go to a triple monster movie matinee. We'd come home, we'd watch Roller Derby on Channel 9, WOR Channel 9, on her black and white television, followed by wrestling, and followed by it was a, a monster movie yeah. on uh, it was an old show, Zachary Shock Theater on Channel 11, where they played old uh, universal black and white horror movies. And... Uh, that was paradise. That, that was the day in paradise for me. And was it just the two of you, usually? Yeah. Uh-huh. But when I woke up on Sunday morning, sleeping in, the, uh, in my mother's old bedroom, which was also my first bedroom, I come into it. My, my grandfather was always there in bed. He had come home at some very late point. You know, and I'd get in bed with them, and I'd have a big stack of baseball cards, and I'd have my have my grandfather cover the names of the players, and I had to. But I was like seven and eight, and I was I knew the, every card, the player's name, his position, and the team. And so those, when you tell stories about your grandmother, which they sound, you know, incredible, the, the wrestling and the B movies. What what are you seeing in your mind when you when you tell those stories? What are you seeing? Um, one of the anecdotes I always tell about going to horror movies with my grandmother in that part of the Bronx, which soon became Fort Apache, but this is as it was nascent, you know, is that we're in the theater, I'm like seven, eight, nine, all the other kids in the theaters, are, it's all kids, but most of them are older than me and they're, and they're rougher. And here comes my grandmother, she's the oldest person by 40 years in that theater. And she gets so carried away when the monster finally gets flamethrowed or <laughs> immolated or um, whatever, <laughs> she would stand up and st- she was so carried away. She, she, I remember her standing up once and saying, "Good for you, you bastard! How do you, how do you, how does that feel?" You know, she got, she was so. I don't know what was going on in her mind. It sounds like Pauline was a larger than life figure. And you know, so she, she was she, larger than life physically and mm-hmm. smaller than life inside her own head. Right. One of the things I've read you talk about before is how you guys would sit in the window and look out on her street. Yeah, corner. I mean, if you look in any neighborhood, in any urban culture, you know, in, 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 a, in a black neighborhood, in a Hispanic neighborhood, in an Italian or working class, you'll always find older women sitting in the window with maybe a pillow under their arm, looking down, like the street was the television. So she was one of those, uh, you know, uh, window color color commentators, you know, and she'd be sitting in a chair, um, and there was an old uh, painted over potato bin under the windowsill. The building was, was constructed in 1917. And so there was old potato bins. They had a dumb waiter, you know. Um, and she'd look out the window, and I'd be next to her. And she'd say, come here, come here, look. Look, you see this guy here? And then she'd tell me the whole drama of him and his mother. Like, this guy, he, he, was, uh, he was colored, but his wife was white. And she said, 
He's the he's such a gentleman, and his wife is such a tramp. She goes out with anything in pants. But he's the type of gentleman. If he goes into a lobby, and he sees there's a white woman there, he doesn't want to scare her. So he'll wait until she takes the elevator, goes up the stairs, you know. But her, uh, let, uh, let me tell you, you know. Um, so she tell me these stories, but she telling me these stories like she's talking to an adult. Yeah. And you're so like I ta- and I take them in in the spirit of how I was being told. So you know maybe maybe this is this is false, but I feel like I became a storyteller as much from her narratives, from her aerial narrative, from her crane shot narratives as they did from my my father's father who wrote and was uh, i think he worked in the yiddish theater street you know in the 14th street area theater and what were you what do you feel you were learning about the human condition the, the neighborhood whatever from from her from her vantage point in that window drama drama um uh suffering drama um it was like the jewish la pieta you know um like the story about this there was one guy it was starting to be junkies in the neighborhood it's like still late 50s early 60s and she look at this guy and she she say she would say like that junkie best see that he's he's a junkie Every time he sticks a needle in his arm, it's like sticking a needle in his mother's heart. It's oh my god, cut, you know, print, you know. But you know, I'm taking this in. Uh, here I am. I'm 70 years old, and I'm verbatim telling you what you said. When she's talking like that, I'm just like, I'm like, saucer eyes, you know. And my brain is somebody's typewriting on onto my brain. back to to wrestling what was it that was exciting you about that i mean obviously it's physically very exciting there's the characters there's the drama of it but what do you think was making you go all in on it to the point where you had these because characters on your, on your wall you you kind of were just you know. you, there used to be these uh, charles atlas um ads in the back of comic books you know the weakling gets sand kicked on him by the bully and he it's this fantasy of being all powerful, mm. having big muscles, um, throwing a punch, taking a punch. Uh, I was not. Um, when it came to fighting, I was not. A, I was not physically brave, um, and because my ma- my mother, yet again, was raised by this guy who's almost like a cartoon of tough guy. Um, I mean, one of the most traumatic things in my life was me and my friends were, we were like 12 or something, standing in front of the building, our, my building at night, and some group from some other nether parts of Parkside came down, and they just attacked us. And um, some kid sucker punched me on the side of my head. My reaction was to leave, as opposed to fight back. And when I went upstairs, my mother had seen the whole thing from the window. And um, I was, I, was, I felt so bad. I, somehow I, I got in. I took a bath. I never take baths. I just didn't know what to do with myself. I felt so scared and also self-consciously, self-conscious about the humiliation and how I how I let myself down by not fighting back so my mother comes in i'm in the bathtub she comes in and she says i saw that and then she quoted uh, my grandfather 
uh, or this is her version. She said, someday, my son, you're going to learn that two of the greatest joys in life is beating the hell out of somebody and getting the hell beaten out of you. And once again, something, so I think of all the books I write, they like cops and wanderers. Yeah, that line I was is not a tough kid. Yeah. I was not a fighter. Clockers, all this stuff. You know, and once I started writing, which required hanging out, so I'm doing clockers and stuff like that. I'm going to some very scary places. And I just feel like my whole life, in a way, my whole literary life is, is like an, oh yeah? Would you, would you be in this crack house at three in the morning? W you know, without anybody watching your back? You know, would you, would you go in, would you follow cops into an apartment, you're the only one without a bulletproof vest? You know, it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah? And I feel like it's crippled, you know, it's, it's made my um, psyche a little on the infantile side when it comes to masculinity. Um, and, and it drew me to, or listen, I had an affection for urbanists. I grew up in a housing project. My grandmother lived on Vice Avenue. Um, the stories, I, I, ur, urban, out of borough, working class was, was the water in my aquarium and I was the fish. So even with that, on top of that, I had this burning desire not to be me, but be a tough guy that nobody would mess with. So I think there was a lot of compensation mm -hmm. in my being attracted, you know, to people, you know. Um, it's so interesting you mentioned like that, that too. too it Richard. goes back yeah. to the wrestling pinups yeah. on my wall. You I was know? just thinking, yeah. But also, I had I've just reread The Wanderers, and the last, the coda of that book is Eugene's mother saying yeah. the very lines you just well, said. That the two yeah. joys of being a man are being and the hell out of someone or being so, a man. Yeah, no, you know, I, I knew I heard, I knew I read that somewhere, what I just said. I, yeah. so, should, did I pick that up from a book? No, I wrote that book. You wrote it. Yeah. yeah. So, but I mean, that, of course, as, as I get older, you know, that, that is obviously, way, you know, the more I know about myself, you know, the weaker that part of me becomes, you know, in terms of like, are you serious? Yeah. Come on. Uh, yeah, and also, how did your relationship? I mean, with these two powerful women, women in your life, your your mother and your grandmother, they themselves are mother and daughter. And I was thinking, like, they come from the same line. You identify with them in such different ways. How did you process that as a kid? That this is your I mom's didn't. mom. I didn't. I wasn't. Yeah. I was a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother was this way. My grandmother was that way. I wasn't thinking about them in another time and place. You know, I, I didn't know psychodynamics. It was from, light and dark, from, really. From psycho, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, uh, it's just my grandmother's my grandmother, you know, fly around the world in a good way. My mother's my mother, fly around the world and get blasted out of the sky 17 times. Yeah. And how did your, your relationship with the two of them evolve as you hit puberty and adolescence? Because well, we're talking through the vantage point of a little kid, but as you get older... So I still, I never not loved my grandmother. I never not wanted to be in her presence, but I didn't need to be reprieved by her. You know, as I hit puberty, my mother's power over me waned. I think with a bully, any bully, they realize they have a genius for who they can bully and who they can't. And they can turn on a dime. And I think once my, once my mother realized um, she can't get to me like she used to get to me. I'm not six anymore. I'm 13. And, um, I mean, she still had her moments with, you know, with me, but she, she lost power over me. But, you know, the thing is, I always say, we're, we're branded so early. And um, it's like we got a tattoo when we're an infant. And just because we're 70 now, and the tattoo artist died 30 years ago, the tattoo's still there. It's fading, it's fading, but it's still there, and it'll always be there.
Roger Angel, the New Yorker, recently was interviewed on the New Yorker Boys Radio Hour. You know, great. Writer. Yeah. And he said that, you know, from his vantage point now, he looks back and he realizes that so many writers as they age, they keep going back to the same stories when they were kids and mm-hmm. they keep replaying them over and over again in their minds and they take different cracks at writing them. Sort of as they evolve as writers, they keep going back, not necessarily trying to change the outcome, but to perfect their rendering of it. And yeah, keep to, to themselves, apply what they've learned. Yeah, to the scene. And keep, they keep asking, he said, they keep asking themselves, was that the way it was? Was that the way it was? Listen, the, the thing is, in, in, in my writing life, I've never left this fictional Jersey area, which is a stand-in for the Bronx, Manhattan. But the only thing that evolves is how much I've learned, how much subtle nuance and what new learning I can apply to these places. You tend to write about where you're from. I mean, you don't have to write about where you're from, but, you know, listen, I, I grew up in the Bronx, so that, that's my Petri dish as a writer. What were you leaving behind? What did you want to leave behind when you left the Bronx to go up to Cornell and Ithaca? And what did you bring with you? Well, uh, um, I think my parents were very conservative. They were very leery about black people in, in that timid, know-nothing, working-class white way. Um, and uh, I became obsessed with civil rights and be, and uh, what was going on, you know, in, in, the, in the world of race. I remember one of the last times I saw my grandmother, who was born in 1902, and I was talking about all I've learned about race. Oh my God, this woman was born in 1902. You know, she's trying to be accommodating to me, but everything she says infuriates me. And I remember getting so angry, I burst into tears. But who, who am I yelling at? My, my poor grandmothers, you know. Um, this is the one you sat in the window with. Yeah. See, but this is me at 18, not eight. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, um, I'm the one who did the massive amount of changing in, the, in those 10 years. I, I, I was going against the grain of that. I was, it was in, in a very selfish way that helps no one. It was part of my discovery of myself. Yeah. It was, a, it was a discovery of a passion that, I mean, look at the novels I've written. I mean, they're all in some way about race relations. As he was talking, I was thinking to myself about how important racial issues are in a lot of what Richard Price writes. But also time and place. There's a seedy Times Square of the 1970s in the Deuce, Post 9-11 New York, especially Rikers Island and the night of, the fictional town of Dempsey, New Jersey in Clockers, and the East Bronx in his very first novel, The Wanderers, published in 1974. The one glaring thing all these places have in common is that they're not the world of the Ivy League he left for at the age of 18, which got me wondering. Richard said that enrolling at Cornell in the late 1960s, it didn't take him long at all to outgrow his hometown socially, politically, culturally, intellectually. Yet, at the same time, here he was, making it the ground floor setting for his fiction. In the case of the Wanderers, we're talking about teenage, largely Italian-American boys who are rough and tough members of a Bronx gang, sort of like the Jets in West Side Story, out in the streets and in their cramped, complicated homes. What was up with that, I wanted to know. Here's the thing about being a a Bronx kid in the southern tier of New York, surrounded by kids from all over America, mostly middle class, and some kids from, you know, other parts of the world, is that you feel lost. And once again, I didn't realize being from the Bronx was kind of exotic to everybody else. Um, to, To be from the Bronx became a way to, to make myself an entity in a world of... Because I look at everybody else and I was in awe of people. I mean, people, you know, people come from like Upper Westchester, they come from Hong Kong, Barranquilla, Barranquilla, Columbia, Nashville, 
you know, um, I didn't even know there really was a Nashville. Um, and it's a way of ident self-identity. And somehow, when I went, at Columbia, I wasn't, it was in New York, but still, it was like, you know, I just, it just seeped into my writing. It's like a way of saying, I am, you know, which. But I was, and thinking about and picking up on that, you mentioned earlier that you, when you were growing up, weren't exactly the, the tough guy in the gang. You weren't a leader of oh, gang. Oh, never a tough guy right? in any, anything. But yet, as you write The Wanderers and, you, and, and kind of cling to home, you chose the vantage point of, of kids in a gang who are older than you because it's set in the early, like 61, 62. You're yeah, quite but late at the time, than. I'm older than them. But then you're, right, you're the, older the than them writing exactly. 24, they're 16. So time is an interesting element there. But how did you find the process of inhabiting their skin and being them to the it point of It was easy because I grew up with these guys. You know, I wasn't them. And, and on some levels, I wish I was more like them. You know, I wish I was tough. I wish I was uh, Italian, you know, like uh, with my crude association of Italian with tough kid, you know, um, Jewish with meek, intellectual, you know. Um, but it was easy. It was like, you don't have to be the person to channel the person. You take the gang home. And that's what really stood out to me in reading it again is that we go home with them. And a lot of the, the book is about the interaction. Because they lived in my apartment. Yeah, you know? so we're seeing them with their parents and with the gang. Do you know what the division between me and them were? A wall. Every time I got in the elevator, you know, we went to the same schools. We watched the same TV shows. We played in the same playground. Music is a big thing. Music, mm -hmm. you know, when I really started writing the, writing the Wanderers in Earnest, I was at Stanford, and I really felt like a fish out of water there. Because as a grad student, you know, you just what you have you have your seminar and maybe one elective, and the rest of the week you're in Palo Alto doing nothing, um, and so you hold on to home, and so I started writing the Wanders in Earnest, just like to bring me home, and also because I understood that that part of my life, the Bronx part, I'm not wasn't ever going to, I'm I'm never going back there. And it's a way of like taking photographs for your scrapbook of, of for old age. This is, this was me. I like to end every interview by going back to that great New York poet, Walt Whitman, who in Leaves of, Gra of, <laughs> in Leaves of Grass, uh, Song of Myself, he writes these words. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want, to look, want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere, waiting for you. And I like to use that as a jumping off point to ask if 50 or 100 years from now, 200 years from now, someone's coming along either in your family or who just loves your writing and wants to commune with or know Richard Price, where should that person look for you in your New York? In a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's hope and, so. Uh, <laughs> you want to say hi to Lorraine? That'd be great. Let me, let me, uh, let me just run up and see if Oh, she, sure. If she, great. She's working. That's the only reason why she can't. Totally understand that. I just said hello. Okay. And if she's really working, I know she's working. Okay. I know. I can go on and on with that Whitman quote. So I took Richard's answer as his way of saying to me, cut, print, it's time to move on, kiddo. The reason we met in the first place was because I'd become friends with his wife, Lorraine Adams, the journalist, and I wanted to say a quick hello to her before packing up. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed hearing Richard's story. Your Hometown is a Kevin Burke production. For more, visit our website at yourhometown.org, where you can find our art director, Nick Gregg's illustrated scenes and a hand-drawn map of Richard Price's New York. You can also follow us on your favorite podcast app and on social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 
And please check out the show's New York City series page, including information on live events on the Museum of the City of New York's website at mcny.org slash yourhometown. Now, I'm blessed to work with a wonderful production team that starts with executive producer Robert Krowich. Let me also give it up to our art director, Nick Gregg, our editor and sound designer, Otis Streeter, our composer-performer, Sterling Steffen, and our indefatigable researcher, Shaquille Khan. Our branding and website design is by Tama Creative, and our social media team is led by Cure and Jessica St. Bear. A special thanks, too, to our partners this season, the Museum of the City of New York, and a mighty, mighty thanks to the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and our financial partners for their support of our first season. Until next time, thanks for taking this ride with me, and remember, everyone's from someplace, and everywhere is somewhere.